Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar about the evaluation on non-lethal weapons. I'm Dr. Cyril Hopp, I'm working at the ABALT department for 13 years and I will be talking about this subject for the next 40 minutes. I will start with an overview of system and try to put them in a military framework and then the second part will deal about the injury evaluation of specific non-lethal weapons. Non-lethal weapons is not a concept that is new. You can already have uh, some ideas of non-lethality in Sun Tzu, the art of war, very famous book, Before Christ. Today we are using a NATO definition that is quoted here on the slides. Non-lethal weapons are weapons that are explicitly designed and permanently employed to incapacitate or repel person or to disable equipment while minimizing fatalities, permanent injury and damage to property and the environment. So this is the definition we will follow and we will see many technology will go with this definition on the following slides. This is a short presentation of uh, the plan of uh, the speech today. Firstly, I will show some uh, insight on why we should use non-lethal weapons, in which context. Secondly, I will talk about different technologies. Thirdly, I will briefly speak about operational evaluation of this weapon system. And then finally, I will uh, spend the last 20 minutes about the evaluation of kinetic energy non-lethal weapons. So why should we use non-lethal weapon? That is a legitimate question. When we see how many uh, gear a, a modern soldier already has, adding a non-lethal weapon is not trivial, so we should have a good reason to do so. Here are a few examples in the following slides. The first example I pick here is a protest that occurred in South Africa in 2012 in the platinum mine in Marikana, wha where the protesters were demonstrating against their condition. You see they are weaponized, there are thousands of protesters uh, having been there for weeks and then finally uh, the law enforcement agency got overwhelmed and started shooting with wheel ammunition on the crowd leading to a severe 30, uh, 34 deaths and 78 wanted report. Certainly in this kind of uh, environment the use of non-lethal weapon could have been adequate to de-escalate the situation. Another example here is the USS Cole attack. This is a US Navy destroyer that were attacked in the year 2000 in Yemen. The attack was conducted by Al-Qaeda and consists on a boat approaching the destroyer. The destroyer at that time had no mean, uh, but it's little mean to react and decide not to do so and was finally attacked and uh, by, by the suicidal bomb and the verdict is 19 deaths and 37 wounded. Certainly in this case, the use of non-lethal weapons could have been adequate in order to determine that if the target was hostile or not, and maybe to legitimate the use of lethal force to stop it before it was too late. So we saw here two different objectives on non-lethal weapon. It's determine intent and legitimize the use of force. All in all, the purpose is to expand the spectrum of response you can do in a military conflict, going from the regular, very binary situation between not doing anything and destroying the target. Non-lethal weapons gives more answer and proportionate answer in order to warn and stop the target without using little means and if not successful, legitimate the use of lethal forces. Here are some military applications where non-lethal weapons have been identified as very uh, um, suitable. First, we see checkpoints either for people or for vehicle. Uh, certainly in this kind of context, there is a heavy civilian uh, population surrounding this kind of activities. And certainly in this context, the use of non-lethal weapon is particularly uh, suitable. Second case is crowd and riot control, where typically, again, the hostile uh, in front of you are civilians and are not very, uh, are, let's say, mildly aggressive and might uh, be opportune to use a non lethal weapon. Boarding is already very suitable, as non lethal weapon is an effective way to determine the intent of targets, and typically in boarding, this is a very uh, important information to get as soon as possible. And finally, in evacuation operation or in peacekeeping or food distribution, non-lethal means are also quite uh, interesting in order to maintain the order uh, while not using lethal means when the situation 
gets uh, more hostile. So in this very short chapter, we've seen that uh, non-lethal weapon increase the possibilities to create what we call an escalation or a de-escalation of force when the situation uh, allows to do so. It's also very suitable in order to determine the intent of the target and maybe legitimate the use of lethal force. This comes from lessons learned from the past and certainly during the last 20, 30 years in asymmetrical conflicts in Middle uh, East. And uh, we've seen some uh, adequate military scenario where non-lethal weapons are suitable. And certainly you've seen that these scenarios are very close to law enforcement mission as well. This next chapter will talk about an overview of technologies to do uh, non-lethal weapons to do non-lethal weapon. The most famous, I think, non-lethal weapon today would be the taser, so the conducted energy device. More generally, this is an electric pistol uh, that will provoke an electric discharge that will stop the target from moving. You have the representation of the X26 here on the slide. The principle is to shoot two small darts that will impact the target. And these two darts uh, should impact the target with a minimal distance between them. If the distance is too short, then the discharge is local and the stopping effect doesn't work. So in order to work efficiently, the two darts must be separate uh, from at least uh, 20 centimeters one another. Doing so, it means that you have to shoot this dart with a certain uh, angle between them. Uh, this is why uh, we see for the X26, the two darts uh, fly with an 8 degree angle between them. Meaning that at short distance, like less than one meter, we see that the two darts are 10 centimeters uh, one another, which may not be enough to provoke an effect. Between one and two meter, you have the ideal distance for this weapon system, and you see a longer distance, the dart being very separated one another, making the shot very difficult. Of course, there are other models with other characteristics in order to cope with different distances, but typically the taser is a weapon you would like to use at very short ranges. Completely different scale, we see the ADS here, active, active denial system which uh, is a big antenna provoking, uh, creating a millimeter wave. And when aimed at a human target, this wave will provoke a sensation of pain on the targets by making the outer layer of your body, the skin, uh, hot, meaning that you will move away from the zone that is aimed with the targets. This system has wrongly been compared uh, to microwave. So for those who knows a bit more about uh, this kind of technologies, you have the specs on the right showing that in this case we are dealing with millimeter wave, so very different wavelength than uh, a microwave, meaning that these won't penetrate the body deeply and will have a very different effect. We have here the LHAT, the long range acoustic device. This is basically a very big speaker that is oriented in order to communicate or to uh, annoy a target at reasonably long distances. So particularly efficient in contexts where the distances are quite high, at quite high, for example, naval application. We see for the model here a uh, sound level that can approach 150 decibel. So obviously uh, this has to be used uh, with uh, limited distance uh, in order to prevent ear injuries. We see on this slide a laser-based system. So in this case, we are speaking about dazzling laser. The objective is to annoy the target or to warn the target of something. Typically, we use green light to do so. At it is the color that is the less injurious for the for the human eye. The objective is uh, to provoke uh, an effect on the vision of the target. It can be used also to blind sensors. We have some uh, pictures here showing the GBD3C, which is uh, a mounted uh, laser on a weapon, or it's a configuration it allows to mount on the weapon, and. Uh, we see for this particular system, we have an NOHD of 63 meter, meaning that below this distance, the laser becomes too powerful for uh, being non-injurious for the human eye. So in order to prevent that, uh, the 
use distance has to be higher than 63 meters. In this particular case, the system is also equipped with a range feather, allowing to shut off the system if the distance is too, uh, too, uh, too close. Chemical weapons are also a very big, uh, uh, a very big category of non-lethal weapons. We see here a pepper spray, which is uh, in fact now uh, oleoresin capsicum or OC spray. This is uh, some uh, natural pigment of uh, pepper that is used in the spray in order to provoke an irritating effect. The irritating effect can be assessed with the Scoville units. You have some example on the of the scale on the right, and typically for an OC spray, the Scoville unit would be between 500,000 and 1 million. In a military context, obviously, uh, this is chemical weapons, so uh, we have to be particularly attentive while deploying this kind of weapon in order to comply with the conventions. And then finally, kinetic energy non lethal weapons, that will be uh, the, ca the category that will interest this the most on the second part of this speech. The principle is to fire a projectile with a weapon system, and the projectile will hit the target, making an effect. And we will speak about that a bit later. We see on this slide uh, how this projectile can be quite different. We have uh, one big category of these being 40 millimeter projectile. Those are the three on the left. And they are typically propelled with a universal grenade launcher uh, that you see uh, on the bottom left. This is the F2000. So these projectiles are between 40, 50 grams. It depends a bit. And they are propelled with velocities of about 100 meters per second. Then on the right, you have the rocket-shaped RB1FS and the beanbag, which are 12-gauge projectiles, also pyrotechnically launched with existing launchers. You see the shotgun or 12-gauge uh, uh, pistol on the bottom right. And these have uh, typical velocities between 90 and 150 meters per second. And you have a huge variation of mass between projectiles. And then in between, finally, we have the FN-303, which is uh, a bit different as it's using its own launcher, uh, pneumatic launcher in this case, in the version of a rifle or a pistol. Uh, in both cases, the velocity is between 75 and 85 meters per second, and the mass of the projectile is 8.6 gram. So we've seen on this slide that the characteristic of all of these projectiles are quite different one another, and the difficult part would be to assess all of these uh, using one single evaluation method. To conclude this part about technologies, we've seen that there are various technologies uh, being non lethal weapons, and they all have different scales, different means to operate, and they are working efficiently with different results at different distances. Certainly, they all have advantage and advantages and disadvantages, making them suitable in certain cases and not suitable in others. I move on then on this third part concerning the operational evaluation of uh, non lethal weapons. This is a very difficult task indeed, uh, as it's influenced by many factors. To do this operational evaluation, we have uh, two different methodologies. The first is to get information on when weapons have been used. This is what we call a return from experience. And in our case, we have two partnerships to do so, one with the Federal Police, CGSU, and one with the, the Special Police uh, Peloton Anti-Banditisme anti in the city of Liège. And the, tip, the type of result we get are represented here on the slide. So uh, we get operational results, we get ballistics results and medical results each time a uh, non-lethal weapon system has been used. And then we can build some uh, graphs showing the result of individual weapon system. You see, for example, on the right, the use of FN-303 after uh, more than 20 used case and more than 100 impacts. We see that in 20% of the case, we have a partial neutralization. In uh, many other cases, we have a disorientation or reflex or movement of the target. And in fewer cases, we have sometimes uh, no effect at all. It, of course, depends a lot on the used weapon system and also on the operational context. <laughs>
Another way to perform operational evaluation is to recreate a scenario in uh, the sense of an exercise and to see how this different weapon system behaves. This has been conducted in the large-scale exercise NNTEX 15M for maritime and 16L for lands in Belgium in 2015 and 16. And the purpose was to create for the first uh, boarding operation and for the second checkpoint and vehicle based operation using non-lethal weapons. So the idea was always to propose a scenario where the troops use their regular toolkits and their regular gear to perform their task and then they can re-do uh, the scenario a second time using all the available uh, non-lethal weapon on the market. This is what you see on the left. And the purpose is to compare how the troops were efficient in their mission uh, when they have non-lethal toolkits comparing to when they did not have the, the non-lethal toolkits. How this evaluation was uh, performed, there are different ways to do so. Firstly, there were many cameras uh, during, the, during the exercise. There were systematic interviews of the troops after the runs to see uh, how they saw the exercise and what they would see as suitable. There were a lot of briefing and debriefing, of course, and finally, uh, observers and referee were omnipresent in, uh, the, in the, the, the framework of the exercise. You have an idea of the results in a NATO unclassified report, uh, and you also have some insight in the publication that you can see on the bottom of the slide. Some example of results. It consists on ranking of system depending on the scenario you see on, on the top of the slide uh, ranking for boarding operation. You have also some uh, question asked in order to see how uh, the troops uh, see uh, the use of non-lethal weapon. Were they effective, for example, here to deny access? And you see that mostly uh, people agree on that. And then finally, the graph on the right shows how the use of, an, of a lethal mill was, uh, was uh, performed uh, during the scenario when or when the when the non-lethal means were accessible or not. So you see on the left, for a not hostile threat, the use of lethal outcome was used more than when the non-lethal weapon toolkit were available. And we see on the right when the threat when the threat was indeed hostile, that uh, the the lethal outcome was still uh, performed when the non-lethal weapon were available. So this is an interesting result showing that bringing non-lethal weapons in the loop doesn't prevent the troops to use their lethal mean when the threat is indeed hostile. To conclude this part, uh, we've talked a bit about the operational evaluation of non-lethal weapon. Uh, we have two ways to do so. Once one is based on operational retex, the second is based on exercise. In both cases, this is very difficult to assess, but this is what we can do uh, to have something meaningful. And finally, the added value of non lethal weapon has been uh, systematically assessed as mostly positive. That brings me to the second part of this speech, which is the evaluation of kinetic energy non lethal weapons. So, as an introduction, I will uh, state the objective of this evaluation. The purpose here is to develop methodologies, scientific methodologies that are adaptable to any non-lethal projectile. We've seen some characteristics in the previous slides. That's a challenge to have a method that is both adaptable, for example, to 40 millimeter, but also to shorter uh, 12 gauge projectile. The assessment should be performed on the whole weapon system, meaning the projectile, but also the launcher. Indeed, the launcher will have an influence on the muzzle velocity and then on the impact velocity of the, uh, of the projectile. And it will certainly also highly influence the dispersion of the weapon system. So all these different conditions of impact should be assessed and in the end should allow to define distance of engagement. And typically we will get then a minimal distance below which the impact is significantly dangerous and um, maximal distance above which the projectile is not effective in terms of dispersion. This uh, result uh, is, um, the purpose of this result is to give information to the industry in order to develop new product that will deal better with uh, the user uh, expectation today. 
and also to help uh, the procurement in order to provide the more suitable projectile and finally to help the definition of uh, doctrines in order, for example, to define the distances of use. So what about kinetic energy? We, we're speaking here about ballistics. Kinetic energy is always mentioned. So the first question to raise is, can we just make a simple evaluation of this weapon system based on kinetic energy? As a reminder, the kinetic energy is the product of the mass by the velocity squared divided by two. Here, a uh, small example on how uh, reasoning on the kinetic energy can be misleading. You have two kind of impact presented here. On the left, a surf from Shahapova, so a 57 tennis ball, 57 gram tennis ball flying at 180 km per hour. That makes 71 joule. On the right, you have a knife thrower throwing a, fur, a 340 gram knife at 60 km per hour meaning only 48 joule, so less than the tennis ball impact, but certainly more lethal. So we see that uh, kinetic energy is not a good criterion when we change a lot the properties of the projectile, and this is typically uh, the framework in which we are working here as we have very different projectiles one another. So in order to do our evaluation, uh, let's have a look on what's happening in real life when uh, kinetic and non-lethal weapons are used. This is a report from the NIG, so the National Institute of Justice in America in 2004, that reports about uh, 100 impacts uh, fired uh, from the law enforcement agencies. We see on this table in yellow that uh, the thorax abdominal uh, zone is indeed uh, the aim zone and almost uh, that's the most uh, impacted zone uh, of about 50% uh, of the case. And we see on the thorax that we can have serious injury uh, in terms firstly of penetration, so projectile penetrating the human body. These are always harmful injuries. And then we see sometimes even provoking uh, the death of the target. So certainly the thorax is an important zone to study in terms of uh, lethality evaluation for these kind of weapons. Secondly, we see m very few impacts on the head, only 2.5%, but typically serious injuries as well with fracture or penetration. So these are not the kind of injury you want to injure on the head. So certainly the head evaluation is uh, also of importance. How to perform an injury risk assessment now? The problem we have here is that we want to study something we cannot really replicate on the lab. We cannot shoot on people to see if they are getting injuries from uh, this projectile. So we have to find alternative ways to study uh, what we want to quantify. The first approach we can follow is to perform the test, perform the shot on uh, something that behaves almost like a human body. And we have two different leads here, either shooting on PMHS, so PMHS being post-mortem human subject. Uh, this is in fact cadavers. And the other uh, lead is to use uh, animal testing. So both these methods are very valuable as they provide raw data that shows how a human body uh, approximately behaves. So they are very useful and we will make good use of them. The problem they have, of course, is that uh, firstly, ethically, these are complicated tests to perform, technically also very difficult. Financially, these are very expensive tests. And finally, they are not reproducible, meaning that uh, every test using a human cadaver or animal testing will make a different results, meaning it is certainly not a good way for a standardized test. So the alternative approach we will follow uh, on the following slides is to use what we call a surrogate. A surrogate is a um, biomechanical target that is developed in order to behave just like a human body or a numerical simulation. So both of these, in order to give consistent and reliable results, they should be validated on what we want to, to perform. And to do so, we will make good use of the results of uh, PMHS or animal testing in order to validate this model. And if we consider these to be um, to be representative of, of what's happening on a real human body, then we have a methodology to predict what we want injury on real human bodies.
A few concepts now that will be used in the following slides. This is certainly the, the most completed slide and uh, the technical information of this presentation. The first concept we will need is what we call the AIS. The AIS, abbreviated injury scale, is a dictionary of injuries. So this was developed by doctors in the framework of uh, the automotive industry and they have quantified every injury you can imagine uh, occurring on the human body. On this codification they performed, you have an injury severity score going from 0 to 6. 0 being nothing to report, 6 being uh, an almost deadly injury. And in between, you have an example here for skeletal, uh, skeletal injury on the thorax. So we see that, for example, one being one rib fracture, two being already multiple rib fracture and a sternum fracture, and so on. Typically, in Western country, we tend to put the limits of a non-lethal weapon being of an IS-001, meaning we allow this kind of injury to occur during the use of non-lethal weapon and two being already too serious. And this is a very natural limit as typically between zero and one AIS, you won't necessarily need a medical hospitalization. If you go above, if you go at two or more, typically you will like to go to the hospital to do at least a checkup. So this is mostly the threat, the, 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 the division we use between uh, what we allow for a non lethal weapon and what we don't allow, but obviously it really depends on the operational field and how they define their mission. Once we have this uh, way to characterize uh, injury severity, now we can study what we call an injury criterion. So an injury criterion, it's a parameter or a set of parameters that you can measure and that has the ability to predict injury. So when you do, for example, uh, an evaluation using a surrogate or a cadaver, you will measure injury criterion and you will make the link with a certain type of injury you want to quantify. And you have the following graph. While the criterion is low enough, you have no injury. And when the criterion is high enough, you have always injuries. And then you can make a statistical link between the two. And the better the injury criterion is, the steeper the curve you will find between these two. This is, for example, a good injury criterion we see on this slide. And it allows us to define a decision rule that will uh, link the injury probability and the value of the criterion, meaning that the value of the criterion will help us uh, dimension the injury probability. In this case, uh, we have a decision rule that says if the criterion is lower than a certain value x, then the probability of injury that we have characterized with AIS is lower than 50%. This is the kind of injury uh, prediction we will make in the following slides. Obviously, if we want this prediction to be reliable and uh, meaningful, we have to measure this, um, this uh, injury criterion on a biophilic surrogate, meaning it has to react just like the human body. This approach can sound familiar to you. This is because this is exactly the approach we use in the crash test domain where biophilic surrogates were developed. For example, the Ibu tree dummy you see here and uh, injury criteria are measured during car crash in order to predict the injury severity during a car crash and to score uh, the safety of different vehicles. So, we have many things to study. I showed a few slides before that many impacts are worth investigating. In the framework of this webinar, I will only speak about the thoracic evaluation and I will develop the subject using two different methodologies we've developed through the years at the ABAL department. The first method is based on a surrogate and the second method is based on a numerical approach. Both of these are heavily uh, influenced by the work uh, of Cynthia Beer here, uh, you see on the slide. She's a professor at Wet State University and the raw data, the basic data we use are coming from her work. You have a few uh, publications on the bottom of the slide. These are the kind of results you can find in this publication. Uh, it consists of uh, cadaver tests. Uh, impacted by different projectiles. You have two types of projectiles which are represented on the right. 
140 gram and 130 gram baton projectile and they are shot at 20, 40 and 60 meter per second. And the objective was both to see how the human body reacts during this impact and to investigate uh, what could be a good injury criterion for this kind of impact. We are speaking about uh, thoracic impact exclusively in this case and the kind of injury we are measuring are rib fractures. First results here are what we call the biofidelity corridor. So this is how the human body, in this case the cadavers, they reacted during the impact. So we see here in the black curve a summary of all the individual results. These are very important results as they will be used for developing afterwards a surrogate. So if you want to have a surrogate that is considered valid, it has to show the same kind of behavior for when undergoing the same kind of impacts. Second very interesting result is the establishment of an injury criterion, which is called the viscous criteria here, the, the VC max. So the main uh, measurement here is the displacement uh, of the target at the impact point that you can see on the top left. Using this uh, raw measurement, uh, we can differentiate it in order to get the velocity of this impact point uh, during the impact. And we can then multiply both this curve, the, the green and the red one, in order to get the blue curve uh, the viscous response. The only thing I did uh, also doing so is to normalize the displacement by the initial thickness of the thorax, which is normalized as 0 0.236 meter uh, in order to get the compression. So the V being the velocity of the impact point and the C being the compression of the target. You have the blue curve then on the right, the viscous response, and the maximal uh, value of this curve is the injury criterion VC max. The decision rule that was obtained during uh, this test session was if you want an IIS lower than two, then uh, you have uh, to respect a VC max lower than 0 0.8 meter per second. And this is linked to a 50% probability. So the first approach is to build then a biomechanical surrogate that are valid uh, with the curve we showed before and which is able also to measure the VCMAX. We have two candidates here at the RMA. In order to do so, we are developing a third mean today. Uh, the, the first is the 3RBID. It's a uh, three rips ballistic impact dummy. It's a modified uh, crash test dummy and it can measure the displacement thanks to LED insight or to the use of accelerometers. The second mean is the BTTR, the blunt trauma torsoric. It's a polyurethan cylindrical membrane with a laser displacement system inside. It is initially developed for assessing the evaluation, for assessing um, behind armor blunt trauma, so what occurs behind uh, ballistic protection undergoing a ballistic impact. And it has been extensively uh, validated for a non lethal projectile as well in the publication you see on the bottom of the slide. The test setup we can use using both this uh, surrogate is then scheme here. We have on the left a dedicated pneumatic launcher that can propel the projectile at uh, characteristic velocities. Between the launcher and the target, you have uh, tools in order to measure the impact velocity. This can be uh, optical light screen barrier that are typically used in ballistics, or also high speed camera that not only can help measuring the velocity, but also seeing the impact. And then on the right, you have in this case, the three rips with an accelerometer measuring the displacement of uh, the impact and ultimately the VC max injury criterion. This is an example of the validation of the three rips. So we have uh, the corridor in black. Eh? Those come from the cadaver study I showed uh, a few slides before. And we have in colors the results we got in the lab. We see that the curve follow the trends and can also leave the corridors after a certain time. In our case, that's uh, not a big deal in the sense that what we are interest in, interested in is the measurement of the injury criterion VC max, and this occurred earlier uh, in the curve. So you see in the, with the red dots, 
when the VC max occurs and we see that uh, when it occurred the signal is indeed still into the corridor making it valid for this assessment and then on the bottom you have a table uh, summarizing the VC max uh, measured value uh, using the system compared to the initial test and we see good consistency here as well second approach to do this evaluation is to numerically model the impact so in order to do so we need a validated thorax and we need it we need a validated projectile to do so we will follow the following scheme on the top of uh, the image you see the validation of the thorax it will be performed thanks uh, again to the comparison of the numerical model results with the cadaver test i showed a few slides before the second part of the graph on the, below, on the bottom is to model the projectile. We will see uh, about that in a few slides. And when we have these two conditions, we can perform the simulation and ultimately compute the injury criteria. The first part uh, is the validation of the thorax. To do so, I will just show you a bit how, uh, how the thorax is developed. We have uh, first a simplified rib cage and we have uh, the model of a few key organs such as, uh, such as the lung and the heart here and the rest is filled with flesh. We see here how it is uh, validated. So again, comparing the curve with the response uh, obtained during the cadaver testing and we see again that uh, the the surrogate, the numerical surrogate, is uh, indeed valid uh, in the timing when the VC Mac occurs. Second part is to model the projectile. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot uh, use regular characterization tests in order to model our projectile here, as we are dealing with a highly dynamic impact. So, quasi static tests usually used for characterization is not valid in this case. So we've developed a new test bench to characterize a projectile. It consists in shooting the projectile itself on an infinitely stiff structure comparing to the projectile and measuring the dynamic of the impact in terms of uh, geometry, so the crushing of the projectile and the evolution of its diameter, and also to measure the impact force thanks to the, an embedded force sensor in the structure. Here is an example for the model of uh, RB1FS. So this is a 12 gauge uh, rubber projectile in the shape of a torpedo. This has been shot on the rigid wall here. You see a schematic showing the structure and the embedded force sensor in green. Here is a picture of the, the mesh used for the projectile. And here are a few results comparing the impact diameter as a function of time and the force as a function of time, both uh, for the experimental results obtained on the force wall experimentally and the produced result by the numerical simulation here. And we see here good consistency between both these results. So these tests remain um, necessary to perform uh, the numerical simulation. But once you have a validated thorax and a validated projectile, you can perform then the simulation that I've shown uh, as an introduction of this part and ultimately compute the VCMAX injury criteria. Finally, I show here a consistency graph showing the comparison of the surrogate approach with the numerical simulation approach. We have a graph showing how the VCMAX will evolve when the velocity is increased. No surprise here, in both cases, the VCMAX increases when uh, the velocity is increased and we can uh, finally find a critical velocity for this projectile of about 85 meters per second in this case when the projectile becomes too dangerous and we see for both approaches a very good consistency in the result which is very encouraging uh, for both methods Finally, a very important part is uh, the standardization effort. So all of this work uh, means nothing if nobody is using it. So uh, we are putting a lot of effort in trying to standardize the methods and other methods uh, I've not mentioned here in a NATO standard. So we are leading a key group uh, at NATO level to uh, write this STANREC 4744 documents, which describes how to perform an injury evaluation of kinetic energy non-lethal weapons.
So far, we've produced four, projecta four documents, sorry, AP94 being uh, for the skin penetration evaluation, 98 being for the dispersion test, 99 being the thoracic impact evaluation. These are the results I've presented in this presentation. And then finally, one last document, AP103 for the head impact evaluation. The good news is these documents have been recently unclassified, meaning they're absolutely openly accessible worldwide to any countries through uh, the portal nso.nato.int. Look for Stanrec 4744. An example of an implementation of the Stanrec 4744 uh, in order to get a final result on the injury evaluation. You have on this table uh, the evaluation of the 40 millimeter Nobel spore shot by uh, FN2000, FNF2000. In the, in the entrance of the table, you have distance and of engagement. They correspond to an impact velocity that can be measured in a lab, but by performing external ballistic tests. You have an idea of the kinetic energy there, and I have to remind you this is absolutely not a good injury criterion. And then the different columns showing the test of the different implementation of the e of the Stanwyck 4744. The first being the injury uh, evaluation on the thorax. This is the test we've shown on uh, this presentation. And then three other columns for assessing the skin penetration, the head criterion, and the dispersion criterion. In the case of this weapon system, we see that a distance below 30 meter is dangerous for the thoracic impact, and we see a distance above 60 meter shows a significantly high dispersion that is typically not wanted. And finally, we see head impacts are typically uh, quite dangerous, whatever the distance is. All of this result can be found in the document on the bottom of the slide. To conclude this part about injury evaluation, we've seen that uh, there are many different kinetic energy non lethal weapons and they are widely used, but uh, they are usually poorly evaluated. And certainly the difficulty is that there is no magic criterion. We see a lot of evaluation based on energy density or on kinetic energy. These are not good metrics for performing evaluation. In order to do a significantly better evaluation, we should assess penetrative impact, thoracic impact, and head impact at least. This can be performed thanks to uh, scientific methods based on biomechanical data. In the framework of this webinar, we've shown two approaches for the thoracic impact evaluation, one based on the surrogate, one based on numerical models and both approaches are consistent. Finally, if you are interested in the topic, I strongly encourage you to have a look at the Stanrec 4744 documents where you can see how to perform a full evaluation of kinetic energy non lethal weapon systems. I'm now reaching this con the conclusion of the webinar. I've gone through many points involving non lethal weapon. I hope I give you a bit uh, of insight of what can be done in this aspect. We've seen that uh, this kind of weapon are very uh, different one another and they can be very suitable for modern era military operation. We've seen different technologies uh, doing so with uh, very different advantages and disadvantages and certainly different uh, framework in which they can operate, typically different distances of engagement. We've seen that it's very difficult, but still possible to evaluate their performance. In order to do so, we will, should work in very close to reality uh, framework, just like retex or exercises. And then finally, we've spent a lot of time speaking about one standardized method for assessing the thoracic injury. But uh, if you are interested, you can still find other methodologies in the Stanrec 4744.